Good morning, everyone. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Welcome to online worship with Bel Air United Methodist Church. My name's Sean. I'm one of the pastors here, and it is so good to be with you today. If you're new to Bel Air, a special thanks and welcome to you and everyone. Would you do me a favor, and would you take just a minute of your time this morning and fill out a digital connect card? The link for it is in the chat, but if you've got the service streaming on the TV, just send me a quick email at pastor at belairumc.org. It's really helpful for me to know that you are worshiping with Bel Air this morning, and we want to make sure that you have a way to connect and share your prayer requests with your church family. So take a minute, fill out the digital connect card. Last Sunday in the afternoon, we had a a lovely outdoor communion service here at the church. It was our first step in navigating our return to in-person worship gatherings. And I know that not everyone is ready to gather in person. That's okay. We're going to continue our online worship even as we walk back into into on-campus worship opportunities. And our on-campus worship is going to look different than it used to. It has to look different right now. The coronavirus is here to stay, and as we learn to live alongside it, our priority will be to keep one another safe the very best we can. I sent out a video earlier in the week that gives you some more details on what you can expect in the weeks ahead, so if you haven't seen that yet, you can find it on our YouTube page or at belairumc.org slash stay connected. But really, stay tuned and stay in touch because every week we'll be updating you on the in-person and on-campus, excuse me, the in-person and online opportunities that we will have that week and how you can participate. It's going to be a fall like we've never had before, but it's going to be good. And I'm excited to walk through it with you. Now, as we enter into worship, hear this reminder. There is no fear that the Holy Spirit cannot overcome. There is no door that the Spirit of grace cannot breach. This is good news indeed. So let us pray together. With rushing wind and holy fire, come, Holy Spirit, come. With tongues of flame and hopes rekindled, come, Holy Spirit, come. With visions birthed and dreams restored, come, Holy Spirit, come. With spacious grace and depth untold, come, Holy Spirit, come. With rushing wind and holy fire, come, Holy Spirit, come. Welcome to worship. Oh 
Amen. Friends, earlier this week, I sent out a letter to our congregation inviting you into a joyful fall here at Bel Air UMC. Now, I know that there are plenty of things happening in our world right now that conjure up anxiety and grief and fear and anger and just about every emotion except joy. And I'm convinced that we as people of faith need to be honest about the challenges of life and face them head on. At the same time, I'm equally convinced that joy, as with all the gifts of the Spirit, is available to us in every circumstance, even in 2020. We're going to focus on joy this fall. It's not a series, but a thread that we will weave throughout everything we do. And I suspect that it will take on the feeling of a spiritual discipline because we'll face plenty of challenges that do not inspire joy. And we'll need to be intentional then about looking for joy, intentional about asking God to give us joy, intentional about sharing God's gift of joy with others. So I invite you to be joyful and to think about the joy that is in your life. I'm also going to invite you to be generous and to think about generosity as it takes shape in your life. This month, we're starting our annual generosity and stewardship focus. You'll get emails and letters about it. We'll talk about it in worship. And and I want you to know it's not just fundraising. That is part of it, though. No, we talk about generosity and the discipline of stewardship each year because it's an important part of our personal discipleship a part of our personal discipleship that needs continual attention year after year, a place where we can continually grow in our faithfulness. And it's an important part of our planning for ministry in the year ahead. So I invite you to come with me, to come with me into a joyfully generous fall here at Bel Air UMC, trusting that God will show us the way and that God will give us everything we need. And as we continue to worship, would you join me in our affirmation of faith? We'll say it together with the words on the screen. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning, church. We are Abby and Ruby Perdon, and we are so glad to worship with you from home this morning. Our scripture reading is from Philippians chapter 1. But before we read, would you join us in prayer? Let's pray. Good and gracious God, whose works are greater than our wildest imagination, Plant the seed of your word among us today, and let each of us welcome the good news with great joy. Inspire in us deeper thinking and more compassionate living so that your love will burst forth from us to nourish the world around us. Amen. A scripture reading is from Philippians 1 verses 3 to 11. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you. Because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you, because you hold me in your heart. For all of you share in God's grace with me, but both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer. 
that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you determine what is best, so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hi, friends. I'm Latoya, one of the pastors here at Bel Air UMC. I'd like to invite you to join me in this time of prayer. You know, our new sermon series, it reminds us just how important it is to pray as it strengthens us and enriches us through our spiritual lives. So as we pray, I invite you to join me. The responses will be on the screen. I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and you may offer here our prayers as we go throughout the prayer. Join me now in prayer. Lord in heaven, we gather in prayer to give you praise and to make our requests known to you and to intercede on behalf of others. We give you praise for you alone are worthy of it. You are great, Lord God, and greatly to be praised. You are our rock and redeemer. You are our peace in the midst of the craziness of this world. Settle us now, Lord God, as we worship you. Settle, settle us even as you open our eyes and increase our awareness of the ways of this world. Settle us as only you can, that we may not look to the left nor to the right, but in this moment, may we look to the heavenly hills from which comes our help. Lord, we try every day to live into your love Yet so often we fail to keep your commandment of love. We thank you that your mercies are new every morning. Help us to be new every morning. We thank you that you lead us on a path of righteousness for your namesake. And we ask that you would help us not to be so rigid or stuck in our ways. Mold us and shape us into the children of God, the followers of Christ that you desire for us to be. Lord, be our dwelling place and dwell within us that we might be a vessel for your perfect peace in all that we do and say. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, there are so many concerns in the heart of each person gathered with us virtually, too many to name. So as we lift up our concerns to you, Lord, help us to trust that you already know the concerns of our hearts, those spoken and unspoken. We lift up to you now every person struggling with disease and illness. We pray that every person will have the support and care that they need. Lord, there are so many inequities in health care. So we pray that you would bridge those gaps, help those in need and bring your healing power, we pray. We pray especially for all those battling cancer, autoimmune diseases, mental illness, and diseases that they, they have yet to even learn about. We continue to pray for those affected by COVID-19, and we ask that you would send a cure, a vaccine, and most of all, healing and wisdom and patience as we wait. May no more lives be lost because of carelessness or disbelief. Help us to be optimistic and hopeful, yet wise in our dealings with one another, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray now also for those walking through the pain of grief and despair. Bring your comfort, bring your care, and help them to know that the sun will shine again, even though it may seem so dark in their lives without that loved one that they miss so much. Give them hope for tomorrow and peace that passes understanding and help us to know how to love one another well during times of loss when we often don't know what to say or do. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are in positions of leadership and authority here locally and around the world, for leaders in the community, in business, hospitals, and churches, for leaders in government in both high and low places. May those entrusted to lead do all they can to lead well, 
putting service and care for your creation above selfish desires and agendas that divide us in so many ways. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask also for special blessings upon teachers, students, administrators, staff at schools, parents, and everyone involved in the education process for our children during this pandemic and at all times as teachers are learning new ways to teach and students are learning new ways to learn, parents are learning together alongside of them. Give us all an extra measure of grace because there are no experts here to show us all the way. As we go through and grow through this learning process, help us to work together that we may support one another well, that the education of children may not suffer. Help them to come through this process smarter and stronger with new skills that they would not have been afforded otherwise. Technological skills, academic skills, and soft skills such, a, such as adaptability that will go through them throughout their lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, as we close this time of prayer, continue to be in our midst as a church family. May we become more and more reconciled with you and one another each and every day, regardless of our differences, with honor, with respect, and with love. May we cherish each other more fully that we may fulfill your great commission even in these trying times. Though we worship from many places, help us to feel close to you and close to one another that we may be the church you are calling us to be for such a time as this. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you join me now in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as we continue to go before the Lord in this virtual worship service, I invite you to prepare your heart to worship God through giving. Giving is a discipline that enables the church to continue the work of ministry in numerous ways. And I thank God that we are blessed to be a blessing. And I especially thank God for you. You can give three ways here at Bel Air UMC. You can give online. Just go to belair.org slash give and you can set up your donation. You can also text the word give to the number on the screen. And finally, if you prefer to give by check, write that check now and mail it to the church. The address is on the screen. We thank you in advance for what you will give and we thank you for what you have given over the years and over these months during this pandemic. We know that sometimes it's not easy, but we give God all the glory for the opportunity to give to his kingdom so that we can all work together for his good. Let us pray. Holy and living God, we thank you for being the God who provides. Your streams of mercy, love, and grace are never ceasing. You continue to provide for the church, for resources for those in need, and we thank you for that. May we continue to be the church in spite of our present circumstances. Bless the gifts given today and the givers that both may be fruitful and work for the good of your kingdom. In Christ's holy name, amen. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to i 
God, we know that your spirit is with us. We are apart and yet bound together in you. So God, we pray that your spirit would move in us as individuals and as a church to open us up, to open our ears and our eyes, our hearts and our minds so that we might hear a word from you. And God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all of our hearts will be acceptable and pleasing to you, God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I was in elementary school, I was in the school choir. We lived in a little town called Ladysmith, Wisconsin, and just to be clear, being in the school choir wasn't any kind of distinction. Everyone was in the school choir. That was music class for each grade, and and I loved it. I loved singing. I loved being a part of a choir. It was fun for me. And a couple of times each year, we would do some kind of performance, a a concert in the fall and in the spring for all the parents to come and see how cute we were dressed up in our white shirts and black slacks. And I have only one clear memory from elementary school choir. It was the day after our fifth grade spring concert, and we were watching the video of our performance from the night before. There were a couple of songs in that performance where how shall we say it, where, where my voice was a bit more prominent than the others. Now, I hadn't been assigned a solo in those songs. I just was super excited to sing. And while we were watching this video, I could hear my friends in the class talking about me, about the way I was singing. I don't know what they said, but I know they laughed. And they were laughing at me. And from that day on, I have not wanted to sing in public. Not once. Now, I've done it. I do it all the time, but I have to force myself each time, all because of those kids in fifth grade choir. And I'm telling you this because we're in this series about songs and singing, and I know very well that we all have different relationships with music. Some of us know a lot about music. Some of us know a little. Some of us like this kind of music, and others of us like that kind of music. And we all have different comfort levels with singing, don't we? Some of us love to sing as long as we're in a crowd. Some of us love to sing as long as we're by ourselves. Some of us haven't sung in years because some kid in the fifth grade laughed at your voice. So regardless of your knowledge of the songs we sing in church or the songs we talk about in this series, regardless of your comfort level as a singer, there is one thing I know to be universally true about music. It opens up a part of our heart, a part of our soul, a dimension of the human experience that opens up in no other way. This is a reason why God's people have always sung as part of worship, because through music, God opens up a part of us that we sometimes didn't even know was there, and we're able to connect with God in even deeper and more wonderful ways. 
So today we're going to keep on with our Praying Twice series. It's about some of the songs that we sing in worship, and the the song that we're digging into this morning is called Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. It's one of my favorite songs. We sang it to our kids when they were infants, rocking them to sleep, and, and what we'll discover is that this song has its roots in a passage of Scripture. It's a story, this scripture passage, about the people returning to God. They had strayed. They had been unfaithful to God, but now they're turning back to God. Turning back to the God who has always loved them. The God who has always been faithful to them. The God who is seeking after them each and every day. It's from the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel, chapter 3. And I invite you to read it with me if you'd like. 1 Samuel, chapter 6, beginning in verse 3. Then Samuel said to all the house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, Then put away the foreign gods and the Astartes from among you. Direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So Israel put away the balls and the Astartes, and they served the Lord only. Then Samuel said, Gather all Israel at Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered at Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord. They fasted that day and said, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah. When the Philistines heard that the people of Israel had gathered at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. The people of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, and pray that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. But the Lord thundered with a mighty voice that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion, and they were routed before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah, and pursued the Philistines, and struck them down as far as beyond beth Then Samuel took a stone, and set it up between Mizpah and Jeshanah, and named it Ebenezer. For he said, Thus far the Lord has helped us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Several years ago, Elizabeth and I took a trip to Canada, to Vancouver and Victoria to be exact, and one of the things we encountered on our trip was something called an Inukshuk, an Inukshuk. Here's a picture of one. You can find them all over the place. There are big ones and small ones. Essentially, each one is a pile of stones, but it's a pile of stones that served a very particular and very important purpose. You see, the indigenous and First Nations people in Canada built an Inukshuk to mark sacred places. They would build one of these stone monuments on a place that was important to them, a place where something beautiful had happened in their lives, a place where something terrible had happened in their lives, a place that was important for their history, a place that was meaningful to their family. And they would also build these Inukshuks to mark the way. To mark the way from sacred place to sacred place. And to mark the way from these sacred places back home. So when you were between places and you saw a pile of these stones, you knew you weren't lost. You knew you were headed in the right direction. You knew you'd be able to find your way home. Our scripture story this morning ends also with a pile of stones. Verse 12, this is our key verse for the morning. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Jeshanah. It says stone, singular, but I think the image we should have is of Samuel taking a large stone and setting it on top of a pile of stones so that it is up high, so that you can't miss it, so that you can see it from far away. And he's doing the same thing that the First Nations people in Canada are doing with the Inukshuks. Samuel is marking a sacred place. For the people, this is a sacred place because this is the place where they recognized that they had been unfaithful to God. 
where they recognized that they were headed in the wrong direction, where they recognized the depth of their sin and turned back toward God. It was an incredibly important moment in their life, and this is where it happened. So now, for the rest of their lives, there's a monument that marks the place so that they can remember, so that they can remember the way back to the Lord. There is no doubt about it. They will again turn away from the Lord. That's what people do. They will again let sin creep into their lives. That's what happens to us. But now they have this pile of stones to remind them that they can always return to the Lord. And what happens next in verse 12 is even more important. Samuel set up this stone between Mizpah and Jeshanah, and he named it Ebenezer. Ebenezer is Hebrew. It means stone of help. He named it Ebenezer, for he said, thus far the Lord has helped us. This pile of stones that they put together isn't just to mark a place where they, the people, did something. It's a reminder for all time and for everyone who will come after them that the Lord has done something. In the story, what the Lord does is help. Help the Israelites defeat the Philistines, which is something they could not do on their own. In fact, up until this point in the book of 1 Samuel, all the stories were about how the Philistines kept overpowering and embarrassing the Israelites. And now, they've marked the place where the Lord has helped them. But notice how Samuel says it. He doesn't say, the Lord helped us here. That's true. That's what happened. But what he says exposes an even deeper truth. What he says is, thus far the Lord has helped us. Meaning, everything that has happened thus far in life has happened with the help of God. Every moment that has come before this moment has been a moment in which we experienced God's help, whether we knew it or not. Let me say that again. Every moment that has come before this moment has been a moment in which you have experienced God's help. Think about that for a minute. Every moment of your life, you have experienced God's help. That includes all the moments before you knew God, all the moments before you put your faith in Jesus. In those moments, God's grace was helping you helping you to find your way to Him every moment of your life, including the moments you felt furthest away from God, including the moments that turned out to be the worst moments. Because of something you did or because of something done to you, God was helping you then to be stronger than you thought you were. Through friends who picked you up when you had no strength left, God was helping you to not give up or to start again after you had given up. Thus far, the Lord has helped us. It means that every moment until this very moment, God has been helping us. And that's true for individuals and for our church too. Next year marks our 75th anniversary as a church here in Bel Air. Every moment of our life together, the Lord has helped us. The Lord has helped us to worship and to serve. The Lord has helped helped us to care for one another in sickness and in health. The Lord has helped us when we've been weeping and when we've been celebrating. The Lord has helped us to reach out to the world around us. The Lord has helped us to send people on mission to various places locally and globally. The Lord has helped us to learn and to lead. The Lord has helped us to heal when we've been hurt, to forgive when we've been wrong. The Lord has helped us to succeed, and the Lord has helped us when we've failed. Thus far, the Lord has helped us. And here's the thing about saying that. Here's the thing about saying, thus far, the Lord has helped us. We believe that it's going to continue. We know that it's going to continue. There's no question about it. God will never stop helping us. Today, in this moment, we can say, thus far, the Lord has helped us. And tomorrow, no matter what happens between now and then, tomorrow we can say, thus far the Lord has helped us. And the day after that, and the day after that, and every day after that, we can say, thus far the Lord has helped us. It's always true. But it's perhaps particularly important to remember that this year, isn't it? 
You know all about the the continually developing dangers of the coronavirus. You know all about the terrible tension of this election season. You know all about the worries that we have for our world, for our country, and, and for our families. 2020 has been a wild, wild ride. And thus far, the Lord has helped us. Samuel put up a pile of stones to make sure that we never forget that thus far the Lord has helped us. You know, I was writing this sermon at our kitchen table the other day, and, and, and I looked over at the counter, and this is what I saw. A little pile of stones, a, a little Ebenezer built on our kitchen counter. Here's what happens. Every day, our little girl comes home from school with a pocket full of rocks that she has collected on the playground. And every day after school, she unloads that pocket full of rocks somewhere around the house and makes a little pile of stones. I went looking the other morning. Here's what I found. One, two, three, four, five, six little piles of stones plus one big pile of acorns, which in our house are about the same as stones. Our our daughter wasn't even home when I went looking for these piles, but there they were, all these little reminders of her presence, her personality, her laughter, her. The song we sang right before the sermon, Come Thou Fount, it's a prayer to God. And the second verse starts like this, Here I raise mine Ebenezer. Hither by thy help I'm come. In other words, thus far the Lord has helped us. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. We can do today the same thing that Samuel did long ago. Set up an Ebenezer, a stone of help. It it doesn't have to be a pile of stone on your kitchen counters, but, but it could be. Your Ebenezer could be anything that reminds you of God, anything that reminds you that thus far the Lord has helped you. So here's what I did. I wonder if you might want to do it too. I made a list of Ebenezers in my life. None of them are actual stones, but they are all reminders of God's help. I want to share just a couple of them with you to get you thinking about the Ebenezers that I suspect are all around you. So this one, this one is a little dove paperweight. It's a little dove paperweight that I got at the first church I ever served as a pastor. It was a gift from one of the matriarchs of the church. She's gone on to glory now, but when she gave it to me, she said, I want you to have this. And I want you to keep it for a long time. But when you look at it, I don't want you to think about me. And I don't want you to think about this church. I want you to remember the Holy Spirit who is with you always. She was a saint. And of course, when I look at it, I remember her. And I remember that church that I served. But but I also remember the Holy Spirit who helps me every single day. It's on my desk now. And when I look at it, I remember thus far the Lord has helped me. Here's the second one. This second one is smaller. It's my dad's class ring from high school. I keep it in a box at home. I hardly ever look at it. My dad died when I was three, so so there are no happy memories that go along with this ring. But it's nonetheless a monument to God's help in my life. A monument to all the protection and provision that God gave to a boy who grew up without a dad, to a family that experienced unspeakable tragedy, but began to heal with God's help. I didn't bring the third Ebenezer, but it's my son. He's named James, just like my dad was, and it felt like a miracle the day he was born. It felt like a miracle. And I know it wouldn't have happened without God's help. He's seven now. And every day of his life, he's been a reminder that thus far, the Lord has helped us. What are the Ebenezers that stand in your life? What are the things, what are the people, what are the places that remind you of God's help? Think about them. What are they for you 
You should write them down. You should make a list. All the Ebenezers, the things, the people, the places that remind you of God's help. Pretty soon, you'll start to see them everywhere. All these proverbial piles of stones, all these Ebenezers, all these Inukshuks that mark the sacred places in your life and that show you the way home to God who loves you, who's helped you thus far, and well, who won't ever stop. You know, the old preacher joke used to be that all you needed for a good sermon was three points in a poem. Well, I don't know how many points I've had today, but here's the poem. It's our song for the day, and it will also be our prayer to God. Let's pray. Come, thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise mine Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he, to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. O oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. O oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Amen. Friends, it's been a joy to worship with you. And I hope that you're already making a list of things that remind you of God's grace and help in your life. A couple of things I want you to know. This Wednesday evening at 6 p.m., we're going to have a prayer service here at the church on our new front porch. It's right off of the front parking lot next to the sanctuary. Thursday and Friday, the sanctuary will be open for personal prayer if you'd like to come spend some time here. We'll send out an email with all the details, but you can find them also at belairumc.org slash stay connected. And mark your calendars for Saturday, October 31st. It's Halloween, and we're going to serve our neighbor, or serve our neighborhood with a socially distant trunk or treat in the West parking lot. It's going to be a lot of fun for everyone who comes, but it's also going to be a lot of fun for everybody who volunteers to help. So if you're willing, if you're able to decorate your trunk or your car or your truck and help with this event, would you email us please at info at belairumc.org to get the details and to sign up. Thanks again for being here this morning. Let's sing once again. He stands in victory.
precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath. Friends, go in peace to serve God and your neighbor in all that you do, and may the peace of Christ go with you. Amen.